Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Assembly Judiciary. I know we've had a few days reprieve as it's deadline week and we're up against another deadline in a few days. So welcome to everyone here in Las Vegas and anyone that may join us in, I'm sorry, here in Carson City and anyone that may join us in Las Vegas, as well as anyone watching online. With that, um, Secretary, please take the roll. Assemblywoman Bilberry Axelrod. Here. Assemblywoman Cohen. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Assemblywoman Gallant. Here. Assemblyman Gray. Assemblywoman Hansen. Assemblywoman Hardy. Here. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Here. Assemblywoman Marzola. Here. Assemblywoman Mosca. Here. Assemblywoman Newby. Here. Assemblyman Ortliger. Here. Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Present. Assemblyman Urich. Here. Chairwoman Miller. Here. And with that, please mark um, Assemblywoman Hansen present when she arrives. Again, just a few reminders, everyone, please turn down any of your electronic devices. Also, we will have a public comment at the end of today's hearing. Uh, today, we have two bills that we're hearing. We're first starting with Senate Bill 55, presented by John McCormick, which revises various provisions relating to courts. And with that, I will officially open the hearing. Mr. McCormick, when you're settled and ready, please begin. Actually, Mr. McCormick, may I ask if you scooch over one chair? Just, it helps me to see you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I was hoping to hide, but. Um, uh, my name is John McCormick. I'm the Assistant Court Administrator at the Supreme Court. The last name is M-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K. And I believe with me in Las Vegas is Judge Melissa Zaragoza with the Las Vegas Justice Court. And we're here today to uh, present SB 55. And at the risk of jinxing myself, I will say that this is primarily a cleanup bill. And obviously we're going off the first reprint here. Um, in the uh, section one was deleted by amendment. Sex, uh, section two of the bill changes the language uh, regarding uh, clerks of justice courts from deputy clerk to clerk, so it's a wording change. Uh, and that, that occurs several times in the bill. Uh, section three was deleted by amendment in the other house. Uh, section four, again, uh, deals with clerk of court and uh, court administrators for justice courts, particularly the large ones like Las Vegas. Uh, section 5 um, of this bill amends the jurisdiction statute for justice courts to remove a provision that currently allows the Nevada Highway Patrol to file tickets into all adjacent counties and townships. So it would uh, require that those, cite those citations are filed into the township in which they occur. Uh, section six of the bill <coughs> allows the transfer of cases uh, in a, a justice court when the entire bench has to recuse or is um, uh, disqualified. Judge Sergos, I have some examples on that one, but say it's in the case of when uh, a member of the bench becomes a victim of an offense and so none of the other judges on the court would be comfortable hearing that case and can be transferred to another justice court uh, to be appropriately handled. Section seven is another uh, section that um, deals with the clerk of court, deputy clerk of court language issue. Section eight, uh, this section uh, impacts what the amount of credit people get for uh, completing community service when ordered by the court. Currently, um, the statute is, or the statute requires that the course must provide credit of $10 uh, or the amount of the state minimum wage um, for that uh, community service. We would like to uh, change that so the amount of credit for community service is not less than the state minimum wage, but it would allow courts to in fact give more credit um, than that, uh, 10, is it 10.50 right now? I think it's 10.50. Um, you know, just because that amount may not necessarily be appropriate in most jurisdictions. Um, you know, the, the median hourly wage in Washoe County is 25.36. In Clark County, it's 24.21. Nevada's uh, median wage is $18.22. So it's just to update that language to allow an appropriate amount of credit for those community service hours. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
And then we have uh, sections 9, 10, 11, and 12 are uh, all, again, removing deputy from the clerk language. So it is the clerk of the court, not a deputy clerk. And then finally, the bill repeals two sections uh, of statute, those being NRS 4.290 and 4.300 that are, I would wager to say, antiquated language dealing with successor JPs. Uh, so who takes over if an office becomes vacant? Because standard practice is that the county commission for the county in which the township is located does an appointment process for vacant offices uh, and th this just repeals those old uh, sections that conflict with sort of modern practice. And with that, uh, that's a brief overview of the bill. Uh, I would turn over to Judge Saragosa. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Miller and members of the Judiciary Committee. Um, my name is Melissa Saragosa. It's S-A-R-A-G-O-S-A. -A -A, and I'm with the Las Vegas Justice Court. Um, Mr. McCormick uh, has presented most of what I had to say because there's really uh, what I would call a, a simple kind of a boring bill almost, which is the kind I hope you like. <laughs> um, section 4, I just wanted to touch on this changing of the language from the deputy clerk to the clerk and give you a little historical perspective. Years ago, the clerk of the court actually fell under the county clerk. That separated years ago, and this language was just never updated. So it left us in a position where there is no statute that exists that either authorizes or says who the clerk of the court is. We just, we've been using the chief judge but that rotates every time we have a new chief judge come into place. In reality, the person who is the clerk of the court is our court administrator. Um, and we didn't want the court administrator to consistently be referred to as the deputy clerk, so we're trying to update that language since that separation from the county clerk took place. Um, we've also stricken some language in here that required the clerk of the court to post a bond um, that just isn't necessary. Um, so that's the purpose of changing that deputy clerk language. I'm going to skip ahead to uh, section 6. Uh, and as Mr. McCormick stated, in Las Vegas Justice Court, we've had several instances where either a family member of a judge or the judge themselves was the victim of an offense, and then that criminal case came into our court. Obviously, everybody on the bench had has a personal relationship, and even the appearance of that case being handled unfairly if any one of us were to hear it. Yet, in this particular um, statute, 4.3713, uh, while it allowed for the transfer of cases in certain circumstances, that was not one of them. And what would happen in order for us to handle that case properly and, and deal with our judicial canons, we would have to bring a senior judge in and pay a senior judge to handle a case that could have been handled by one of our neighboring townships. So that is uh, the purpose there. And then there is one other part that just didn't make sense in Part A. It allowed us to transfer a case involving um, criminal conduct, and, but it required that the defendant had to appear before a magistrate before that happened. Well, if that magistrate is the one that has the conflict of interest, then that man magistrate can't hear the case and then transfer it. They should take no action on it whatsoever in order to be in alignment with our judicial canons. So that is why we've stricken that portion of subsection A. Finally, um, I'll just make one brief additional comment on Section 8 where we talked about the um, making the credit, the community service credit towards any fines or fees, a floor instead of um, a mandate that it's tied to minimum wage. Because when minimum wage has changed, change, like it's $10.50, it's very hard to make that calculation. It's a lot easier for us if we use a nice round number like $15 an hour or $12 an hour instead of kind of having the change involved. So that was one of the other reasons that we, um, in fact, Las Vegas Justice Court, we had looked amongst ourselves to make it $15 an hour credit towards um, fines and fees. And we found we couldn't because of this statute. So that was one of the other reasons. And I'm happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. And with that, we will begin questions. I, I believe you're both ready for questions. All right, questions. Our first question is from Assemblywoman uh, Bill Bray Axelrod. 
Thank you, Chair. I may have two, so if we have to go to a, a second round, it is a pretty easy bill, and I and I appreciate the work from um, the as introduced bill to what we've got because one of my concerns was Section One, and I believe the intent in taking Section One out is that we're not limiting muni and justice courts to not be open on Sunday. Is that correct? Uh, for the record, John McCormick, uh, yes, Assemblywoman, that, that was the intent. That section got a little confusing, and so we just decided to ax it and make the bill significantly simpler. And that is the idea, is that uh, justice courts particularly are available at all hours to take application for protection orders in particular. Great. It, do you want me to wait on the other question? Are you asking for a follow-up? Yeah. Well, it's not a follow-up. It's a different question. Proceed. Okay. Um, so my other question was about the minimum wage and, uh, and the $15 an hour. I'm just wondering if it wouldn't make more sense to have language like basic market value or something like that. Like nobody's even getting $15. You go to in and out and you're getting $18 an hour. So I just, I don't know, maybe there's some more permissive language that doesn't put the actual dollar amount. Because I do worry about that in statute when this doesn't get opened again for, you know, 15 years and we have to change it to, you know, $50 an hour. I, you know, that's my concern. Thank you. Uh, thank you. For the record, John McCormick, the idea was, uh, at least uh, in, in drafting, was that we made that the floor, and so it can go up. There's no ceiling. You can never give less than minimum wage, but a court is not prohibited from matching market value, for lack of a better term. Assemblyman Yurick. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question comes in Section 5 on uh, the, with the removal of Section 6 with the Highway Patrol and the jurisdiction of the, the Justice Court. Um, in, in my experience, the, the, I know that they can be quite transient, especially with shortages now where they're having to cross their normal beat areas, and I thought that this provision was in there to kind of help them to where, where jurisdiction of an arrest in one area to have to come back to that area to have to testify later. It was to try to simplify and make it a little bit easy. It looks like it's been removed. Can you just help explain a little bit of the purpose of why that section is being removed? Uh, thank you again, John McCormick, for the record. Um, on that, we found that, and I think that was originally the intent, but sometimes what happens is uh, tickets get filed into a place that is very sort of inconvenient for citizens. For example, I'll use a uh, couple communities in, in eastern Nevada. An, event, uh, an offense occurs, say, in White Pine County. Sometimes it would get filed into Eureka County, so people from Ely would then have to drive 70 miles to Eureka to appear in court and address the ticket. So we're trying, and I understand trying to balance the, um, the issue with NH. Uh, with with NHP and uh, that, but I think it, it we kind of erred on the side of maybe access to justice, for lack of a better term, to make sure people are are addressing their uh, violations in in the community in which it occurred. And frankly, with the uh, with the passage of AB 116 last session and the shift to civil infractions, um, that's opened up and a lot more can be done online now. Um, and you know this. Shameless plug for the administrative office of the courts. Uh, we uh, didn't. We built a um, an online traffic resolution system that a number of, of uh, courts are using. We're trying to to expand that, and Las Vegas Justice Court is working on that same uh, sort of initiative. So th that was the idea: was to to clarify. You got a ticket in White Pine County. It's filed in White Pine County, for example. Chair Miller, if I may, may I add one? Additional point in response to that question? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, the one other thing that I wanted to add was that almost all of our courts will um, offer, there's two aspects of it when it comes to an officer's presentation of any testimony. If it's a civil infraction and it goes to a contested hearing, um, that officer is authorized to provide their written um, uh, anything that's under an affidavit. So the words that are on the uh, ticket itself, plus any narrative that they write on there, and any narrative that they want to present to the court may be done in writing, so they wouldn't have to travel to a different jurisdiction to present that testimony. Additionally, if it were an other, if it was a criminal traffic ticket, almost all of our rural jurisdictions will allow them to testify via um, video conferencing. So that would also eliminate the need for the officer to travel. Do you have a follow-up? I was just saying, that was very helpful information. Thank you. 
And with that, not seeing any additional questions, I will open it up um, to support testimony for Senate Bill 55. If there's anyone here in Carson City that would like to testify in support? Not seeing anyone. Is there anyone there in Las Vegas? Judge, is there anyone actually there in Las Vegas besides you? All by myself. Okay. <laughs> no, Our, Chairman, there's not. All right, thank you. Then I will open it up for testimony on the phone lines. Broadcasting, can you open it up for testimony in support of Senate Bill 55? There are no callers at this time. Okay, then let's open it up for opposition testimony. Is there anyone here in Carson City to oppose Senate Bill 55? Not seeing anyone, and I know there's no one else in Las Vegas. That would be awkward if you were opposing it. Uh, broadcasting, can you open it up for opposition testimony? There are no callers at this time. All right, is there anyone here in Carson City in neutral that would like to testify in neutral? I know there's no one in Las Vegas. Broadcasting, is there anyone on the line that would like to testify in neutral? There are no callers at this time. All right, so I will close testimony and welcome the bill present. Okay, so there's no final words. Judge, do you have final comments on this bill? No, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. With that, then I will go ahead and close the hearing on Senate Bill 55. Our next bill is Senate Bill 62, which I will open the hearing for Senate Bill 62. This is also presented by Judge Zaragoza and Mr. John McCormick. Uh, this bill revises provisions relating to the Commission on Judicial Discipline. And with that, please proceed when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Chair. Again, for the record, John McCormick, Assistant Court Administrator at the Supreme Court. And I think Judge Zaragoza is off the hook on uh, SB 62, luckily. Uh, and hopefully this will be even simpler than the last one. Uh, you know, again, maybe jinxing myself. But what this bill does is, uh, and again, obviously speaking to the first reprint, is clarify uh, who has jurisdiction over potential ethical violations uh, made by a lawyer who is running for judge. Um, and what it does is it clarifies that if there is a potential ethical violation, you know, during the campaign before they take the bench, that will be uh, handled by the state bar uh, and their office of discipline. And then if it's after they take the bench, then uh, the Judicial Discipline Commission will handle those. Um, and then so that leaves the question of non-attorney judges, which would remain under the Judicial Discipline uh, umbrella. And uh, just a little background, this uh, bill um, came out of uh, the Supreme Court's commission to study the rules and statutes pertaining to the Ju Commission on Judicial Discipline and the Rule Code of Conduct. I think that was the full title we gave it. Sometimes we, we, we get a little crazy in our administrative dockets. Um, but again, this was a recommendation out of that committee, and uh, the, that report has been provided as well if you have further questions on that. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Was that your presentation? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thanks. <laughs> I will stand for any questions. I, I'm oh, trying okay. to power through this this morning. Okay. This is like a record-breaking, like a three-sentence uh, presentation. Members, are there any questions? Oh, we do have one by Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. McCormick, uh, for your presentations, short, sweet, and to the point. Um, I did have a question, though, about Section 3.2. Um, it says if a judge is licensed to practice law in this in this state um, could you please explain is there any circumstance where someone is running for the position of judge in our state and they're not licensed to practice here uh, thank you John McCormick for the record uh, for district court judges um, uh, Court of Appeals judges, Supreme Court justices, there are statutory requirements. They have to be an admitted member of the Nevada Bar with certain amounts of uh, experience practicing in the state. And then for uh, Justice of the Peace and Municipal Court judges in jurisdictions of a certain size, so over 100,000 
generally they have to be licensed attorneys, members of the Nevada State Bar. There are some of those smaller rural jurisdictions where um, the judge is not required to be an attorney, and so those are that would only be the case. But generally, to be a judge, where there is a statutory requirement, you have to be a lawyer, you have to be a member of the Nevada Bar. That that that's just sort of a drafting thing, I guess. And so I would just clarify, in those cases where we have judges who are not lawyers and not subject to bar review, they, of course, would be under the judicial review. Uh, yes. Thank you, Chair. Again, John McCormick for the record, and that is correct. The, the Discipline Commission in the absence of bar jurisdiction would retain it. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Newby. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for this bill. Um, I was wondering, just to clarify, the uh, subsection two applies to when whatever offense uh, was was done, correct? So if there was something professionally that the judge did while they were in uh, candidate for office, then that would still be under the bar even if it was discovered after they took the bench. Is that correct? Uh, thank you, John McCormick, for the record. Yeah, it. it clarifies that that if the offense the alleged in, the alleged offense shall we say occurred when they were say running for office and that's generally the primary concern that would be uh, subject to bar discipline and then when they took the bench any subsequent event would be under the the purview of the discipline commission proceed so uh, if you're required to be a licensed attorney in the state of Nevada to be a judge, is it possible then that the bar could disbar you while you're actually a sitting judge? Um, for the record, John McCormick, and I, that would be the case, but I believe that could still occur now if in the event that an, uh, an, an attorney judge did something that violated the attorney code of conduct, the attorney canons of ethics, but not the judicial canon, I, can't think off the top of my head a case where that would necessarily occur. They could be disciplined by the bar and up to disbarment, and then they would no longer be qualified for the seat, so then we'd have that whole mess. So are you saying it hasn't occurred? Uh, correct, Chair Miller, uh, John McCormick for the record. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that has not occurred because generally the, the canons, while the judicial canons are, are obviously more specific to uh, to judge behavior, very similar ethical obligations. Um, another case I could point out is say it was an attorney who um, was managing a client trust account when they were still practicing and there was some alleged malfeasance there. That wouldn't necessarily pertain to being a judge because judges obviously don't have that same trust account requirement. So then that would be a bar issue versus a judicial discipline issue. So I, I believe what we're trying to get at is so let's say attorney-client privilege. As the, as the attorney, that is violated. They've now run for judge. They now have become a judge. The bar reviews it. The bar revokes the, the license. That person is now on the bench. If the bar revokes that license, will that also – remove their qualification then to practice as a judge on the on the bench, even though they were elected? Uh, John McCormick, for the record, uh, that is my understanding because it would then violate the statutory qualifications for the office to which they were elected, and then I think the Discipline Commission would then have to get involved um, in that way. Okay, thank you. I don't believe we have any additional questions at this time. Um, Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to clarify, um, are there any powers that the Discipline Commission has that the State Bar doesn't? So for example, if someone commits something that would warrant removal from the bench under the current system, if we adopt this and they, they did it before they took office, would the state bar also have the power to remove them from the bench? Uh, 
Uh, thank you, John McCormick, for the record. The state bar w has the authority over their licensure as an attorney. So I think in that case, uh, say the bar said your whatever the alleged offense was was so egregious, we are disbarring you and it went through the appeal process, et cetera, and that was found, then they were no longer an attorney, then the discipline commission would come into question because they're no longer qualified to be a judge pursuant to the statutory qualifications. Okay, with that, I will go ahead and open it up for testimony in support of Senate Bill 62. Not seeing anyone here in Carson City. In Las Vegas, do we have support for Senate Bill 62? Yes, Chair Miller, uh, Judge Melissa Saragossa, uh, again appearing. Thank you. Um, while I thought I was going to be off the hook on this one, I did want to just offer one um, piece of information in response to Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong's question. Uh, for reference, ma'am, the uh, provision that talks about the qualifications of a justice of the peace comes from NRS 4.010. And it is in any county whose population is 100,000 or more, the justice of the peace or a candidate for justice of peace must be an attorney who's licensed in uh, the state of Nevada and have five years of uh, legal experience prior to being a candidate. However, for our smaller jurisdictions that are um, less than 100,000 population in the county, they are not required to have those uh, eligibility requirements. They are only requirement is high school diploma. Okay, Judge, we're in um, support testimony. So are you- Yes, ma'am, I, I am in support of the bill um, as Mr. McCormick has presented it, and I do think that it makes a clarification for all judges that are running to have that distinction between who's responsible for handling any discipline. What's happened in the past is that problem where you have somebody running for the uh, position and there might be a, a potential violation and nobody knows who's going to handle it and this would clarify that okay thank you Broadcast thank you thank you broadcasting is there anyone on the line in support there are no callers at this time thank you for that is there anyone here that would like to testify in opposition of sb62 here in carson city not seeing anyone, and I know there's no one in Las Vegas. Broadcasting, is there anyone on the line that would like to testify in opposition? There are no callers at this time. All right, then I will open it up for testimony in neutral. Is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to testify in neutral? Not seeing anyone, and I know there's no one in Las Vegas broadcasting. Is there anyone on the line that would like to testify in neutral? There are no callers at this time. Thank you for that. I will go ahead and close testimony. And Mr. McCormick is waving his uh, final remarks. So with that, I will go ahead and close the Senate hearing, the, close the assembly hearing on Senate Bill 62. With that, our last order of business today is public comment. Is there anyone here in Carson City that would like to make public comment? No one in Las Vegas. Broadcasting, will you open the lines for anyone that would like to make public comment? The public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Thank you for that. So with that, first I will say this is the first time I've had a half hour committee meeting since I've chaired Ledge Ops. So um, this may probably be our final last time ever doing that, but we'll see. Um, we are scheduled for Monday at 8.30, so everyone have a great weekend and this meeting is adjourned.